The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, welcome back, everybody. I'm glad to see more faces today. Um, so the feedback looked pretty good. Um, and once again, I encourage you guys to be brutally honest. I believe wholeheartedly in this whole idea of a democratic classroom. And, you know, and having this feedback process allows to correct and make this an even better learning experience for everybody. Um, so I handed out a couple things. Uh, first of all, I handed out kind of foremost chapter 10 from uh, Douglas Hofstadter's newest book, I Am a Strange Loop. Um, and that's called Girdle's Quintessential Strange Loop. And I think I'm OK, and I'm not going to be sued, um, because as long as it's less than 10% and it's for academic purposes, it should be OK. And considering this is like 15 pages out of a 300-page book, uh, it should be under that. Um, this is supplemental reading. A lot of you raised kind of notions of like, girdle numbering does not make sense. And well, it takes a lot of time to wrap your head around it. I mean, there's a reason why there was one girdle and why he named it girdle numbering. Uh, it wasn't like it was a trivial idea. Go ahead. Is girdle numbering sort of like an anisomorphism between the logic and number theory? Um, so the fundamental idea behind girdle numbering is that you can take the formal patterns in any type of proving procedure, whether it's the MIU system or whether it's proving from piano's axioms and number theory, and you can code those formal deductions into manipulations of numbers, right? And then once you create this link, you create this isomorphism into numbers, you can then just play around with these large numbers, which then decoded give you back formal statements in the system you were playing with originally. So, so maybe like having an equation with no solution is almost having like an unprovable Exactly. So what Latif said is like having an equation with no solutions is like having an unprovable thing. Um, that's actually going to be very close to the essential idea behind Girdle's proof. Um, but if you read chapter 10, I believe Douglas Hofstadter does, um, out of this new handout I gave you, does a great job of explaining some of the key ideas behind Girdle's incompleteness theorem. And that's the main one, that systems as powerful enough as number theory are inherently incomplete. Um, so. That, that's something I want to leave you at least two weeks to kind of chew on, because eventually you're going to work on to chapter 9 in GEB, where he does Mumon and, and Girdle. And uh, there's going to be, that's where he proves or does a version of um, Girdle's incompleteness theorem in, in GEB. But it's really not as clear as I think it's done here. So um, that's just kind of supplemental reading. Uh, so now, on to what I started last time and what should have been the reading assignment for today was uh, the location of meaning in chapter 6. Um, I started out with this idea of, of the rabbit and, and Gabagai, um, but I want to kind of scale back a little bit and, and really bring the question down to, to something which some of you will intuitively know and some of you won't have any idea, and it's the, uh, the following sentence. Um, and please, some of you who know Spanish better, correct my spelling. Um, so, nieve es blanca. Who knows what this means? OK, so everybody raises their hand and says, snow is white. OK. But for those of you who didn't raise your hand, what does this sentence mean? It means nothing. OK. Why? You can't relate to it. So, so far we've kind of got the, the Latif hypothesis, which is that meaning comes from the relationship of, of this to yourself. Um, and this is an idea we're going to try to explore throughout all of today's lecture. And we're going to co-teach. Karen and I are going to do some excellent things. Um, so suppose. You know, you were dropped off in Mexico, and just by hanging out with people, you eventually learned Spanish, and you created you created a dictionary with a set of recursive rules, and you learned that well, we have so certain things like this is equivalent to is, and you understand this in your natural language, um, and you create this method of 
of breaking down senten of sentences, strings, um, into parts, and then going to your dictionary and saying, okay, nieve es, well, I know es is is, nieve, I'm not sure what that is, but um, my dictionary tells me it's snow, and blanca, um, my dictionary tells me is, is white. Okay. So suppose you, you, you've dropped off in, in the middle of Mexico and just by interacting with the people and you've created this kind of um, set of recursive rules for first parsing sentences and I think that the more languages you try to learn, the first thing you're going to discover is the stumbling block is the ability to actually parse what someone's saying. Um, I know when I, when I was living in, in Germany this past summer, basically when someone would talk to me, it'd be like, and I'm like, excuse me? Like, and it didn't even sound like there were words individually. It was just a stream of sounds, right? But eventually, by just being immersed in the culture, my brain ran these kind of neural network algorithms that were, were able to start breaking up those blah, 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 blahs into, um, you know, beer es gut or something like that. Um, and you, you, you could then actually start hearing individual things and then trying to deduce the meaning of those individual parts and then plugging them back together into your natural language into what appears to be snow is white. But what does snow is white mean? Okay. Okay, so Latif claims that maybe the words don't themselves mean anything. But what does that mean? So, all right, so then the question is, suppose I, I wrote on a piece of paper, um, snow is white, and I packaged it into a bottle. So there's our scroll, and I, and I cork it. And I throw it into the ocean, right? And it drifts up on shore. What would then be the cue? So then suppose it lands in this island. And you see this bottle. Why would you suspect that the bottle meant anything? Why wouldn't you just pick up the bottle and throw it in your bag of trash as you go and trying to clean up your beach? It seems very well constructed. So it se Latif says it seems very well constructed. Um, so is there, what is it about this bottle and scroll and cork configuration that cues you into the idea that, that there's information, that there's meaning in here? Paper. Paper. Okay, so it seems deliberate in some senses. So the idea that, well, it seems hard that accidentally, you know, some paper crept into a bottle, corked itself, and then sent it through the ocean. Um, so, so Hofstadter kind of, in, in this past chapter, breaks things down into, into three layers of meaning. Uh, he's got what's called a frame message. We've got an outer message. And then we've got an inner message. So Hofstadter would argue that the frame message here is the fact that there's this strange configuration of a bottle, a cork, and a piece of paper that would cue a human being, any kind of reasonably curious.